Welcome to the Children's Book Author Podcast. I'm your host, Eleanor Page. If you write for children, or it's always been your dream to, you're in the right place. As the children's book author, I'm on a quest to discover everything there is about writing, publishing, and marketing children's books, as well as how to supercharge my creativity, skyrocket my productivity, and absolutely everything else there is to know about how to be the best, so you can be too. Join me as I interview fabulous guests and become the children's book author. Welcome back to the Children's Book Author Podcast with me, Eleanor Page, and this is Episode 5, JJ Cars, the creator of the Cetacean Writing App and also a writer himself. I had the best time talking to JJ, I must admit, because we talked so much about writing and all the insecurities that come up as writers, how we're terrified when people give us reviews and, oh, so many things. I think you're going to absolutely love this one. We go quite deep into the psychology of being a writer and, as I said, our deepest fears. And we looked very deeply, of course, because that's the topic, at the Cetacean app, which is one of the main apps that I use for plotting and I write in it. I do my timelines of my story in it. I do my character profiles in the app. I encourage you to go check it out. There's a lot of apps on the market. You know, Scrivener, a lot of authors tend to use Scrivener, another amazing app. And, you know, this interview isn't really just to promote JJ's app, although it is a really good one. There are lots of other great apps as well. It's really just to encourage you to find something as a writer that works for you long term. And I say long term because I do believe in my heart of hearts that the word app is really not the place to live as a writer forever. You need to find something that helps you expand and grow and capture your ideas and something like Cetacean App is really, really fantastic. And in future, I might actually reach out to other app creators and chat to them about their apps too. So, you know, I'm not biased even though I do use Cetacean App, but check it out. I hope you learn a lot about yourself as a writer, also from listening to us chat about our experiences so far in the writing world. Um, He also talks about some great places to find other writers, community of writers. So that's another big highlight of talking to JJ that I came away with. And overall, he's just such a lovely person. I could have spent a couple of hours with him, to be honest. So I hope you enjoy listening to the interview as much as I enjoyed conducting it. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a super special guest for all you writers out there. It is JJ Kaz, the creator, janitor, and... I missed a word, the owner, creator, and janitor of Cetacean, (laughs) the amazing online writing app that helps you write, outline, revise, brainstorm, timeline, everything you could ever imagine in one app. Welcome so much to the show, JJ. Thank you, Elena. I just said Elena instead of Eleanor. Elena, Elena, (laughs) all of them count. It, you know, like, I, I actually like hearing the Americans say, Elena, because I think it's really cool. And every so often I have a discussion at home. I should make everybody say it that way. And the Australians all go, no, 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 we can't do it that way because we've got to like accentuate that E and it's too hard. So (laughs) it's all good. Welcome, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the program and where you came up with it, how you devised it. Tell me everything. Okay. Well, it came actually from a number of different vectors all based in annoyance and aggravation. <laughs> I'm a, a software developer by trade. I've been doing specifically web application development for 20 plus years. And uh, I've been writing since a uh, teenager, but uh, I really came in to what I call a, an actual writing, caring about the craft and process uh, back in the 2000s when I started uh, writing comic books. 
and uh, sort of move through graphic novels and and some online, some short uh, anthologies that I've written prose for. But um, the annoyance came when, from the writing side, on when I finished read, I wrote a book, which I've decided it will stay in a drawer in a dark place until the heat death of the universe. <laughs> I finished it up. But along the process, I was just annoyed. I was using Google Docs and I noticed I had like 8 billion tabs open on like two monitors of like research material and, and, and stuff. And it was just like annoying. Like this is my poor computer is crying. Chrome is trying to assassinate my, <laughs> my computer. Um, There's got to be an easier way. And I sort of started poking around and looking out there and wasn't really happy with what I found at the same time. I, in my professional, I've sort of worked for startups. I've worked for mid-sized companies. I've worked for major corporations. And the last few ventures have been startups. And most startups fail or, you know, just are unable to make that jump to launch again, get traction. So after a couple of those of being part of that, you know, it starts to go, oh. And then I just decided, well, why don't I just try something on my own rather than, you know, working on somebody else's vision, come up with my own. And so I took writing. What am I good at writing and programming? And let's see if we, we can do it together. And over uh, Christmas of 2019, I was at home visiting my mom. I just was sitting there sketching out ideas. And three months later, we had a beta. And I'm, I'm really glad that you enjoy it so much. You've said nothing but kind words. It's uh, as being like the only person doing everything um, and kind of living in a vacuum. And COVID has not helped that <laughs> at all as far as isolation. It can be real hard. You struggle. It, it, it's just like writing. You struggle. You, you beg for feedback and honest feedback, merciless, cruel feedback. <laughs> That's so true. And I love that you're a writer yourself. Do you know, I feel like I need to go in the shame corner because I never actually asked you that. I was so excited <laughs> about Cetacean that I was like, oh, do you actually write, JJ? Of course you do. How else would you have developed it? Makes so much sense the way that you did. So, I mean, now... Now, listeners and viewers, you're going to have to get used to me, like, completely gushing out, like, how wonderful this program is. But I want to make it really clear that I don't feel that way because, you know, like, I'm, I'm trying to make JJ look good or the program look good. I went on a hunt to find a replacement for Scrivener. And now you might say, why? Why would you find a replacement for Scrivener? I mean, yours was Google Docs and having all those thousands of tabs open so true. I've heard other people with that same problem. And Scrivener is fantastic, but it's really terrible for saving things and like then finding it on every other device. Yeah. And some of the way that it works is still, I still find it really complicated and, yeah. and it really complicated. And I've bought all these courses on it, but it's going to take me like 10 days to do the courses. Do you find that? That's, well, that's a, a sign that maybe you've, you know, become a little bit too complex when other people are making a living off of explaining how to use your software. That's right. Um, so, but they are the 800 pound gorilla in this space. Um, there's another one, uh, if I say uh, sort of an up and comer other upstart to channel them, it's Ulysses, but it's very Mac focused. I mean, exclusively Mac focused. Um, I've never actually tried it. There's something sort of even scarier about that compared to Scrivener. But <laughs> the worst bit was going to bed every night and thinking, did it did it save my work? Because even though it is saved to the Dropbox on Scrivener, every time, often I'll open it on another device and it will say, there was a conflict. And I think, a conflict? And so which version have I got now? There was all this anxiety around it. And um, something just felt, I don't know, like, limited with it so i went on the hunt i went on the hunt and of course all these we were saying off air all these other online platforms with probably bigger budgets that's all that it is right <laughs> you know we just got to be honest about it um that you know came up and that other writers use but when i actually went in to use them they weren't actually that much different than 
Scrivener. There was nothing unique about them. Did you ever try anything else before you create a citation or did you just go for, I'm going to make the best thing that I need? I poked around. Um, there's Scrivener. I looked at Ulysses. Um, there uh, were some other web-based ones. Um, I, 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 each one I looked at, I'm like, no, I mean, ultimately this is a text editor with some stuff slapped onto it and I'm trying to build something from the point of view of writing is not just the time you spend with a, you know, at the, at the mercy of a blank page, trying to put words onto it. It's everything you do before everything, you know, when you just brainstorming about it. And then when you go and have to come out with an outline and then you do the writing and then that was your first draft is going to be terrible. All first drafts are terrible. They're just awful. They're the worst. And so revision has to happen. And part of that is getting feedback on your revision. So I'm like, okay, let's, you know, you can have beta readers and be able to give, just here, invite them, go look at it and be able to read it there and have different version control of like, okay, this was this version and okay, I sent out and I got feedback on this one and be able to share it with editors who can go in and say, no, no, and just, you know, create the, the red screen of death. The red <laughs> like screen of death, I love it. And everything. Oh God, the worst was I had an editor and it's just, think of it, it was like two in the morning. I got edits back on, um, on the story uh, from the editor and I remember opening up uh, Word, it was a Microsoft Word document and it came back and just the screen, the, the room was dark and the screen just cast this red shade <laughs> over everything. It was, it was, oh, it was gut-wrenching it was it, it's the kind of thing it sends you to the grocery store at 2 a.m to look for comfort <laughs> food it was <laughs> you start to doubt everything you know my whole life is a lie <laughs> who am i kidding it was but fortunately like a good they were a good editor they you know a good editor will put you into the, you know put you on the ground they'll knock you down they'll leave you bloody but they also give you a hand they'll pick you back up give you a hug and dust you off and say okay this is how we move forward. Exactly. And it's so it's like built into it is the ability, as you say, to get to build community, to to have to share your writing with other people and to get that feedback and be like mine. I haven't gotten to that bit yet, which is why I'm like mind blown. <laughs> I have not getting the benefit of that part. It's taking a while for that to take traction. And I think it's because um, all writers are insecure. I mean, they, you can't, the, <laughs> I tell people, they say, oh, do you like writing? I said, mm, I like before I write and I like having written. The actual process of writing is just an exercise in self-hate and doubt and self-recrimination. <laughs> and it's it's a terrible thing to just put your through yourself through just emotionally. Uh, so we're kind of guarded, especially when we put our, you know, so much of our, selves and, and create a sense of vulnerability for here's this creative work you know what what do you think and a lot of us as a result just trying to isolate and sort of ball up you know cover our our soft targets uh when really that just that means you're never going to get better it's so true you have to, you have to you have to take those hits, you know, otherwise you don't know how to take a punch. Yeah, that's so true. I, I think what struck me just then, like, to the heart, was when you said, oh, you're never going to get better. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, just, the, what's worse than being a bad writer? A mediocre mm. one. Ugh. Or the one that never writes. I, I tell this people to people a lot. Um, the best, the, um, the worst book ever written is still better than the perfect novel that never gets written because it actually exists. You act, somebody actually did it. Yeah. And so you can either sit there and get, you know, vapor lock from this need for perfection and did not be criticized or fear. It is, it is all fear. It is pure fear. Um, or you can, you know, step out. And if with writers, everyone's coming from that same sort of perspective, uh, assuming that you don't view, writing is a zero sum game these you know these these other authors they're in the same position you are even if they're successful even if they've gotten published you know it's 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 not a race it's it's not a contest they went through the same thing you do and if you know if 
writers also naturally have to have some sense of empathy. So of course they're going to feel for you. So if you, I can bring people together and give them a way in sort of a no judgment environment where they can get honest critique and feedback. So on what they need to change, you know, whether it be characterization or uh, their story structure is, is, is a bit off or they haven't really found their voice or their, for whatever. Um, they're getting some sort of way and they uh, to, to get that feedback and also organize it. So it doesn't just come in and go, oh, well, they sold me a bunch of stuff and I forgot, or it's all in these emails. You could just sit there and go, okay, here's what this one person said about this version, this person about this version. Wow. I can't wait. Yeah, you're right though. It's about taking that step to, to put it out there. I love what you say about how, you know, vulnerable writers feel everything you say is exactly how i feel and even the not writing bit i didn't write hardly anything in 2020 and when i got on scriven i thought well, so that's why i went hunting but actually the the thing about cetacean that really appealed to me is that when that little part of me that wants to procrastinate um would that goes out of the browser to procrastinate right even if i think i'm still <laughs> staying in the story because you know i'm going onto my the app that plots things but then my brain goes new app new app. like i know this app but it says new app new app hold on plotting uh-huh uh-huh when i'm in citation it's almost like i'm in the classroom and it's kind of like if i go out to check my plot my writing's still there looking at me <laughs> right so it, it kind of says like yeah yeah it's like yeah you looked at your plot now here's your writing and it's not like a completely different different browser it's sort of like all sort of encompassed and then if i've got like a you know the world's greatest idea on my other book which happens all the time when i'm writing i just jump out of that script onto the still in citation onto my other one go into the outline or not into the outline to the brainstorm part write down my great idea. No, it's not lost. It's in that other project. And then when I get back, there's my book looking at me again, right? That says 75% done. And so I think, okay, get back in there. And this is, I know this sounds like maybe these are trivial little things, but for someone like me, who's like really distracted very easily, this actually manages to keep me on track because it's quite visual and everything's neatly tied, tied in there. Like, timeline outline brainstorm writing characters locations you've thought of everything like i don't know that i could actually give you another suggestion but i guess because you're writing yourself like you actually have okay uh, tell me it. Them, well no you said you know you write children's books and they're much smaller uh so you know, and by the looks of it you're quite prolific uh, so you were saying some way to have sequels. So you, so you have your, all your research information. So you have a world and you want to write a sequel to it rather than having to re-enter that. You said well, some way to pull it. Yeah. And it's on our development server right now. And it will be going out with the next patch. So you could just say literally from a drop down from that main menu, go uh, sequel and it will create a new project, all your characters, oh. locations and uh, sticky notes. Your brainstorm stuff will be there automatically, uh, this, and it'll be it'll be copy. It's not like they're shared. It's it's it just creates a new copy over. So if you need to make changes to it, you can just do it freely and not worry about what you're doing on the other one. Okay, I'm drooling for when that comes out, like literally, like, so, and that's the other thing. When whenever somebody throws you a suggestion, because you're the person who makes it, you're like, great, put it on the put it on the list, because that'll help me as a writer as well. <sighs> your users always know they're like readers readers and users they always know when something isn't working it turns out they usually don't know what the solution is they think they do so it's important to listen when they complain about something because they are dead right about that but sort of just sort of tune out their suggestion and just go back because there's always other factors at, at, at play i had um a uh, user open up a, 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 a ticket or a suggestion for uh, support, and they did not care for my color scheme. <laughs> so, oh yeah, because citation is uh, has a, a a dark mode motif, and that was the other thing that bug is sort of coming from Google Docs is, uh, you know, it was one thing 
uh, when we were back, you know, in the 80s and 90s, um, when we were using uh, cathode ray CRT monitors and LCD monitors, a white screen really wasn't that bright. Hmm. But now we use LED monitors and they are very bright. And I noticed as I was writing the last book, I was starting to get eye strain and like migraines mm. from it to the point where I like, I can't look at a screen for the rest of the night and hopefully this goes away and it's really debilitating. And I, I found some uh, browser uh, plugins that will reskin sites so I can tr go to find dark mode, but usually it works until let's say Google changes something and then they all break. And so you have to sort of limp along until you something else. And I just wanted something that didn't try to assassinate my eyes when I tried to work. But it's it, 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 that again, it may not be for for all people. Um, I have a little bit there's, uh, there's a you know, concession where you can go and change the editing area, you know, the, the actual part your eyes are staring at. If you don't want something that is in that dark mode, you can go for a different palette. But I, I still believe that overall, I think it's in everybody's best interest to have that that sort of dark mode just to not add to writing is already hard enough you, you, your tool should be trying to make things worse well sometimes you expect things you know a certain way like you know i contacted you and said um it's gray on it's gray writing on the white background which isn't right it should be black writing on the white background and um anyway, i'm working away in gray and then like um like i suddenly refreshed and you had changed it because you listened to me <laughs> and i went oh gosh that black on white is harsh <laughs> <laughs> how did i used to write like that oh well get used to it again you asked him to change it so now you have to stay with bl so sometimes we have these you know like expectations or kind of that your mind's locked into but that's how i always do it and that's how it normally looks rather than as you say, is it actually feel good on your body? Did it hurt your eyes that day? Did it make you more tired than normal? And again, it sounds like, you know, because you yourself write, you really have paid attention to that. And correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like to a large extent, you started building Cetacean as a solution for yourself as a writer, and then, you know, put it out. It started that way. Here's I don't know if you're familiar with the term uh, plotter versus pantser. Yes. Yeah. Um, I love planning. I love plotting. Here's the problem. Once it's like a puzzle and it's sort of the, the sort of something I share in common with, uh, you know, being a programmer, uh, the design phase, how is this all going to fit together? And I like, I, j I'm a, such a nerd for story structure, you know, three act, four act, five act, seven, and just how it after you putting it all together but once i've crafted it all it's a solved problem for me so the motivation to go actually write it just evaporates so with the last book i tried being a pantser a discovery writer um and i actually got stuff done <laughs> so i'm wondering now am i really a you know a pantser i'm like oh and, and it's sort of my goal with citation it's it's a long-term goal. I'm trying to figure out a way. I want a tool for, for discovery writers, for pantsers, because everything right now, including this, is very plotter centric. It's not there for the person who just sits down and kind of has to extract structure <laughs> and plot out of it as after the fact and, you know, and multiple revisions. Uh, so I'm like playing around with ideas of just, you know, trying to add some sort of, um, machine intelligence will go through and try to identify main characters and yeah it's oh but that's goodness. very much down the road wow so as you're transforming the program is going to become like oh my gosh i'm so excited given that you know technology's just growing and growing in bounds where this is going to go <laughs> you know this is going to be like <laughs> extraordinary i'm actually very much a discovery writer a pantser but with a little bit of checking in to plot but that's what I mean. Like I kind of appreciate that I can go in and pretend write a plot. Like even yesterday, I went back into my, I was in my story, and then I went to check the the actual plot as I'd plotted it, and then I thought, oh no, no, we don't want that to happen anymore. That's not going to fit. So I, it was actually like I went back into the plot and changed it, and then back in and went, okay, that feels good. So 
<laughs> it's almost <laughs> like I needed to change the plot part at the same time as I was somehow that helps in my oh. discovery writing. Does that make sense? Oh, that to hear that is just a joy because I always, you know, I was writing as when you created this and I started realizing it, that there's like, like literally half the, the population of writers, this might not be useful to. And so, you know, to hear that you're actually getting benefit out of it is just because I would have, by how much you expressed your happiness with it, I would have guessed that you were a plotter. Would you? Yeah. yeah, no, no plotting. But, you know, like I do buy all the latest things. So I have, you know, Scrivener and Plotter and Aeon Timeline and all the things. And they, they, they like my brain goes, nah. Like, yeah, get in, nah. Like, because I'm not actually a plotter. But for some reason, the plotting works in in this program for me, maybe, as I said, because I can look at them really side by side and just go, and by plotting, you know, I tend to use, like me personally, I know you have different plots, different plot um, mm -hmm. structures that you've put into the it's program. What I want. Yeah. And you can talk to that in a minute. But for me, I, uh, I use the um, <laughs> the Save the Cat one and just having that kind of bare bones of that's the direction that I'm going in. I'm aiming for that transformation of that character kind of around those points and that I can just check in without, again, leaving my manuscript has been amazing. Good. Um, so you, you, there's, I guess, different levels of, of pantsing. Um, some people will just literally start from a, a blank page, but it sounds like, and, and I didn't start from a blank page on the last book. I spent some time like, okay, here's, if you know, follow the, you know, Joseph Campbell monomyth uh, model, he, it, you know, at certain points, certain things should happen. And my characters is going to be, so I have some general idea of who they are and where they're going to end up. So as you're going along, you're doing what, you did and just that sort of check in. I'm like, okay, where am I in the word count? Okay, we're sh we should be at this point. We should be getting out of Act One and moving into Act Two. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is that yeah, you, like you like roundabout with flexibility? But yeah, exactly. Because I still, I personally still believe that some level of story structure, the brain of the reader still likes it. You know, th they that's kind of like how story story does have to go somewhere and have stuff happen and have characters interact in a not necessarily strict way but in a certain way that leads to a, that kind of fulfilling outcome and once you know the rules then you can break them too so even yesterday I wasn't quite on track with my I thought oh it's gone a bit off and I was like double check in no nah, I think it's good we can break the rule today <laughs> You know, it's, but it's the rule is sort of there to be seen and broken. Oh, I agree. Um, the only way I was able to uh, pants the way I did was because I'd spent so many years obsessing over structure. Um, and it was actually not novels that I pulled from. It was uh, first movies and then television, mostly television. Because uh, I, like I said, I started with from graphic novels. And it is a very visual um, medium and where the a lot of the story happens in between the panels, in the cuts, uh, uh, so to speak. And I moved over and started finding the, this was a time when uh, people like John Rogers and Jane Espenson were doing, uh, had blogs out there about, uh, you know, being a screenwriter for television. And I just devoured everything they would, and they would bring up structure and here's, how do you do a break and move a uh, character over uh, the course of a, of a series or an episode? And I just pulled that in. And it, so it sort of creates this critical mass of knowledge of how characters and structure are supposed to work to the point where you can sit down in front of that pantser screen and have the back matter to sort of provide some sense of sanity so you're not just like Jack Kerouac, just typing rather than writing <laughs> yeah typing rather than writing i love that 
it's it's just it's just madness. <laughs> so is your work have you put your work out there? Like is it is it published and out in the world? Do you have like a huge body of work? I don't have a huge body of work. Um, you can find uh, I wrote a graphic novel. Um, uh, co uh, the lady that did the artist was uh, Veronica Fish, who is an amazing artist. Yeah, you can find it on Amazon and or Comixology, which is the the home for for comics and graphics novels. If you want to get them in a digital format, uh, uh, she's I cannot I will sit here and gush over how wonderful she is. She go find uh, I think her most recent work was. Hopefully I'm not wrong, uh, is the uh, Sabrina the Witch comic series. Uh, and she did the art for that, and her covers are just gorgeous. Like I said, I will just gush. She's a wonderful person, uh, just a peach of a human being to work with. And uh, and it made my first sort of foray into a published graphic novel just so much easier. Um, so I, 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 had a, I feel like I had a lot of help uh, with her. The other, I've written actually a lot more comics and like short stories for anthologies that just will, just, I, they ended up never seeing the light of day. And that's just a fact. You, you know, you submit the story and for whatever reason, the anthology doesn't get made. So it's like, okay, well, I did all that work. Wait, did I get paid? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it's, if I got paid, there's really nothing I could be <laughs> that sad about. It's, this is mercenary work at this point. If I'm doing it for myself, yes, okay, you'd be sad about that. Um, uh, I think one that did get out, and you can find it on uh, on like Amazon Goodreads, is uh, called an anthology called Fight Like a Girl, which is a Kickstarter where a bunch of different authors submitted uh, stories about uh, women kicking butt, essentially, <laughs> in various forms. So you've got quite a connection to like um, certain, you know, like the author community. You have your own like connection to particular groups or authors. Is that how you normally work? Very, very particular. And it's really just sort of happenstance and pure chaos. Like I found Veronica at a, at a comics convention, a small independent convention in, in, that was happening in Washington, D.C. And... Um, I happened to meet the, one of the uh, anthology uh, editors at a party through mutual friends. So it's, I really haven't pulled from the online community. It's just been sort of, ha I've blundered into it <laughs> and gotten very lucky. Uh, now they're, I'm like looking around for communities and it's, some of them are very old and some of them are just wild west. Uh, one of them, I did not expect Twitter to actually have such a active writer community, you know, on various tags like writer's community or writer's life um, and people on there. And it's not toxic. That's that's what's shocking about it. It's on Twitter and it's supportive. What? What is this? This is this, this is madness. That is so crazy. I didn't know that. I actually didn't know that because I assumed like everything else on Twitter that it, that it would be. So I haven't found a writer's community on Twitter. So there is like writer's communities on Twitter. This is like news to me. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, several different, there's like, like I said, uh, uh, writer's life, and these are the ha hashtag writer's life or hashtag uh, uh, writer's community, I think are the two big ones. Um, and I just started sort of following them and poking them for ideas. And of course, finding some other, like, it's like there's the author tube community on YouTube, um, and I found some some great ones like uh, uh, Michael Leron, who uh, is an, also a writer, and uh, just there's stuff out there. There's, it's so easy now, rather than 20 years ago, to find that community and that help. Uh, we're sort of lucky and a bit spoiled. <laughs> well, and, uh, and it'd be sort of daft if we did just you know, make use of it. So what do you look for when you look for a community? Like, did you, is it like some, like some, that support in terms of encouraging you forward, giving you that honest feedback that you learn from them? Like what other sort of things? Yeah, it's a, it's a balance. You want to find somebody, you, you want to find a non-competitive, supportive, encouraging community, but at the same time, someone who is going to just eviscerate your work but not do it out of malice or out of need to tear you down so they can 
try to elevate themselves or appear smart or superior. Um, you want to find that <laughs> that sort of healthy emotional abuse. <laughs> um, healthy emotional abuse. I think that could be the title of this Sorry. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but it, it's it's kind of true. It, you need. If you're just told that your stuff is wonderful all the time, you won't believe it. And it doesn't, it won't lift you up and support you. It does quite the opposite. It makes you suspect of any sort of praise. So you could have something that is perfect, but you would, would never believe it unless somebody goes in there and finds the flaws and the cracks um, and, you know, calls you out on them. Mm -hmm. I think that if once people do that and they, when you find that you find a community where you can do that and people, um, like I said, aren't doing it out of malice. Um, I think you've, you've, you've found treasure <laughs> and you should try to support that community and do the same thing to others as you, as much as you possibly can. Oh, that's so wonderful. That makes me want to go out and find my community. <laughs> it really does. Um, yeah, cause I can get a bit, um, I probably changed a lot in the last few years and COVID, you know, did, did change us. I think whether we, recognize that it did or not and I think even though I wasn't writing and sharing I got a bit tougher during COVID like I feel like now if I went out and you know shared my workout and people said this bit sucks that I'd be like okay good let's fix that whereas I was probably a bit sensitive before that I was a bit more like oh mainly because I was getting that feedback through reviews which is probably not the best oh. way to get the feedback i know oh. you're gonna say something about this why would you do this <laughs> who hurt you <laughs> that you I would know. do that to yourself oh like, i've never like i've never gone to look at goodreads to see what my reviews are i've just avoided them they could be wonderful but i'm fine with not knowing but that they're, they're besides they're not for me they're for other people <laughs> so right all it all it is is it's it's either going to make me feel great, but probably I'm not going to focus on the five stars. I'm going to look at that one star review, and that's what's going to make me just, you know, straight to the you know stress eating. <laughs> I I have gotten better at receiving them, and probably don't go look at them quite as much now. But initially, especially you know when I did, and I'm the sort of writer, you know, opposite to you who goes, oh well, that one just never gets to see the light of day. I'm I'm the sort of writer that throws everything out into the world. That's why I'm prolific only. Like a probably very sensible writer would put certain things aside and be like, maybe not put that one out. You know, I'm like, here it is, here it is. <laughs> Throw it all out. Well, no, no, I mean, well, let's contrast and compare. Which one of us has written books that have been published? <laughs> and not just one, but more than one. Clearly, your method is working. Well, I guess it's, I mean, kids, parents are a really tough audience and teachers and librarians, uh, but kids are really forgiving, actually. So I know a lot of people think it's opposite. Really? Kids are not forgiving, that kids are really harsh. But at the same time, they're not looking at the same things that a teacher, librarian, parent is That's looking. True. They're not sort of going, mm, that sentence didn't, you know, wasn't like, didn't have a lot of alliterations and wasn't a great sentence. They're, they're looking, they actually really listen to the story. So if you've got like a good story badly told, this is my theory, okay? You can write into the show and tell me if it's completely wrong and I will put you on and let's have a discussion about it. But um, it's, in my experience, if the story is good, even if it's badly told, and, you know, to be honest, I'm still learning how to write. So let's say my first 20 books were really badly told, but the story might was there, the imagination's there, that it surprised them or delighted them. They sort of went, oh, I didn't expect that to happen at the end. Oh, oh, I really love that character. That's often enough for them to yeah. to like like a book. And they'll say they love it, but then librarians like, oh, no, no, this book's not not good enough and you think oh you know oh, i listen to here like this is such a and i guess it's both isn't it because ultimately i want all those parties to to, lo to love that book well they're looking for different things the librarian is looking for literature kids just want a story with you know astronauts and unicorns um so it's sort of different agendas but you're right about 
if you have good characters, I think that is even more important than plot. Plot is just at best just sort of sits in the background. It occasionally surprises you when it raises its head, but you're really not focused on it. You're focused on the characters because that's what, when you try to describe why you liked a book to someone else, it's the characters that you sit there and go, oh, this, this person, and they're, love, and they're the ones you fall in love with. They're the ones you empathize with and will just scream at and maybe throw a book across the room if the author doesn't do something really nice to them. <laughs> right, when I was a, you know, when I was a kid, my favorite book in the whole entire world is No Flying in the House. No flying in the house. No flying in the house. And it's about this little girl who has to go live with her, with this older lady. And she's got a little dog who's like this big. That's why I have my little dog. He's the closest I could get. <laughs> He's sleeping in the background. <laughs> but, but this dog's like this big and it talks. And so it takes, and it's her guardian. And it takes her to this old lady's house. And I'm going to ruin this. Well, I am going to ruin the story. So I apologize to any people out there that want to read this and I'm spoiling it for you. But anyways, at some point in the story, she has to pick between having parents or becoming a fairy. And and I'm reading this book as a child thinking, well, obviously she's going to pick becoming a fairy. I mean, oh, that's what we'd all pick. <laughs> but no, she picked to have parents. And I remember thinking, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Flung them. But it's my favorite book of all time, even though the character didn't do the thing that I wanted her to do. Isn't that like so bizarre? So it's not your favorite children's book. It is your favorite book, period. My favorite book of all time. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I guess that's me who's be, now become an author who's gone. Well, I mean, you write children's books. So I'm going to be the fairy. I'm going to be the fairy. I'm going <laughs> to fix this wrong in the world. And I'm going to be the fairy. <laughs> So your weird. Are bad, you should feel bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But let's get back to citation. <laughs> so I know we've yeah. talked a bit about writing, which is fantastic because yeah. that's a terrible marketer. No, that's really <laughs> you know brilliant that, that you know to talk about the writing process itself and the journey is I think at the heart and core of citation, and that's why I wanted to have you on the show. And uh, tell me when you picked that name. I citation is the uh, scientific category of uh, animals that whales and dolphins um, fall under. And I really like whales and dolphins have since I was a kid. I, I went through the phase, I think a lot of kids do where they want to become an oceanographer. <laughs> and specifically, I really like uh, orca or killer whales. And um, which is why our logo has kind of that. It's it's really, if you took a, I took a yin yang sign and I turned the, the white part that teal color blue, which is the kind of the color that uh, I grew up on the Florida coast and we have that sort of emerald water. And, but the black part, if you look at it, it's, you know, black with a little white spot that kind of looks like a killer whale. So I sort of snuck it in there and it was very easy to do. <laughs> That's so cool. Oops. I love that. All right. I'm going to go in now and I'm going to show you citation because I want to show how good it is. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's go have a look. So this is now viewers, for those of you that are watching, for those of you that are listening, you're going to have to go online and, um, and look it up. Well, now it's taking a few minutes probably because of my internet's come on. You've got to work now. Let me try yeah, again. You started to break up there for a little bit. All right, let's try again. Ah, dun, dun, dun. No, why, internet, are you not behaving for me today? <laughs> I'm going to have to patch it on to the end of the video, maybe, and just uh, just add on the me showing it through. Oh, it's not It's not behaving. It's not, it's not popping up on Riverside. No. Well, let me try one more time. Hold on, hold on. Because I'm persistent. Ah, I got it. There we go. I got it. There it is. Hey, I recognize that. Yeah. Did you recognize that? Yeah. I think yeah. just a little bit. Nice. Yeah. You made this. Can you believe you made this? This is so cool. Like you are so creative. Forget even just your creative writing. I mean, I know that you're, you know, you see it as probably a really left brain thing, but like there must be a lot of creativity involved in making a program like this. 
it's a lot of looking at what others have done and see what works and see what doesn't and you know try to find a format that kind of fits so i you know did that i took it started actually this started from a template because uh making stuff pretty is not my programming forte believe it or not uh, i am much more a coding nuts and bolts back-end server person uh and uh sort of the oh, we're gonna play with html and css all day and make everything wonderful and animated so that's just been the challenge for for cetacean as far as developing it was to, yeah no the front end is completely important it is like the mainstay <laughs> the well almost the mainstay making sure things save correctly is would be you know slightly more important but <laughs> uh but trying to create a ui and actually when i made that first cut after three months i put it out there and after the beta i went live uh, and it bombed. <gasps> I was getting like nothing and it was really demoralizing. And then I had sort of this, this come to Jesus moment where I'm like, okay, there's a, there's a saying in startups, fail fast and they're right. This is not working. Don't, you know, get rid of the sunk cost fallacy, just have to cut it. And I went, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to rewrite the front end completely and try to make something that is better than what I've got. And that's when I uh, started doing the sort of the workflow model that, uh, that that we were talking about earlier, where you have like the brainstorm and the outline and the uh, writing and revision. Uh, and literally uh, within two hours um, of going live with that, I was getting subscriptions. Mm, because you you nailed it. it. Yeah, it, it, it validation. It yeah. was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, but that's again, you know, like everything we've been talking about. I feel like it's sort of at the heart of what we're saying that um, you know to get that, share it, get feedback. Don't be scared of that. And if it's not good, who cares? Scrap it. Start it again. Make it better. Do it. Do it right the next time. Yeah, fail fast. Just it. I'm through this podcast. I'm realizing how similar writing and coding are the same. I know, know so similar. Um, yeah. yeah, but just ripping it apart and 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 putting it together. And I'm kind of I'm 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 getting the itch to kind of do that again. <laughs> whole thing. Um, I would just sit there and try to to dig. And so I put the rather than having to break out into another one, I just added it in. Yeah, and there is something else I added purely for me and hopefully other people get uh, um, some tra uh, some use out of it and that is the the, the word tracking because uh, when I did the last book I had you know it's easy to write when you're feeling inspired or you're you know the muse is talking to you or whatever you call it um, but that's not how stuff gets done uh, you have to write you, you have to have a word count that you need for the day. It has to be done no matter what, even if you're feeling terrible. So I had my uh, word count. And I can't remember what it was. It was like, a, I think a thousand, it's a thousand words, which is, you know, isn't much, but it was something I could make sure I could get done every day. And so having that on there and being able to see where you're ahead and where you're behind and get some sort of feedback, this is where I am along for my goal was very important to me yeah so good so so good then because remember how i said to you that like like i'm in this and then all of a sudden i have an idea for my other project so i go into my other project and look i've got my ideas there so they're not going to be in some notes folder that i'm never ever going to see again and when i come in to write this one i'm going to go why did i think that that's dumb scrap that one oh this is a good one when did i come up with that one so yeah it's like see and i'm flipping in and out so fast but I never leave my project sort of thing. Yeah, so there we go. All right, that was just me giving you a little a little sneak peek. <laughs> and the neat thing is, is it's free. Um, you can do, well, not everything is free. There are, you know, we have a free tier and a subscription tier. Um, we allow somebody to write a 50,000 word book. I have one project for 50,000 words in it, and you can do that for, for free for as long as you like. If you want to go in and after you're done, delete it and create another one. I'm okay with that. Uh, I believe 
if you give if you have something of value, people will want to support it. Uh, and also, I did want to offer up a barrier. I, my goal for this was to make it easier for people to write, not to sort of paywall everything. Um, but with the subscription, you can do what you do it. Uh, you know, create multiple projects. Um, you can uh, have images. Um, and there are other features that are coming that I can't really talk about <gasps> yet. <laughs> I'm excited. Be, uh, well, I'm okay. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. It's uh, I'm not happy with the current uh, grammar checking. It's very rudimentary. Um, so I'm looking at a solution so subscribers will get a much more comprehensive um, uh, grammar feedback, like you would in like say Grammarly or or um, you know, Google Google Docs. Awesome. Yeah, that would be so good. As long as it doesn't make me go, oh, hold on, the grammar's off. But no, no, I think it'll be great because there are some times where I'm like, if I go back to the word, it's got like red dot underline. And I think, oh, I must have spelled that wrong. Um, but it's a bit harder to change than it might be normally. Yeah, I don't like really super aggressive grammar checking. I want it to go check the stuff that I'm kind of already done with. Don't not this paragraph and definitely not this sentence that I'm working on. I'm trying to get through the sentence. I don't need Google Docs to come up and pop up in the middle of it and just judge. And I'm like, I haven't finished the <laughs> sentence. How can you tell me it's wrong? That's so there true. There hasn't been a period yet. <laughs> yeah, again, I love the way you're so like, um, you've, you've, you're really taking the psychology of the writer into account on every single step you make because you test it out on yourself and go, mm. <laughs> That's a, that's, like, that's a nice way of saying a, a lot of anger, <laughs> writer's rage. <laughs> all these things are real, people. Coming out. You know, all these things are totally real. And this is, you know, the, the everybody thinks that writing, especially little kids, because I'm a children's book author, thinks that writing is the most glamorous job in the world. <laughs> and I always say to them, now, you, if you want to be a writer, you have to sit in a room by yourself and just like write on a blank page and they look at me in like horror <laughs> <laughs> and if you feel bad you still have to do it <laughs> and then when you're done people aren't gonna like it and you're gonna feel bad and know what that you still have the next day have to get down and write again and keep going <laughs> this is the truth isn't it that's the truth and yet yeah. we do it we do it we do it you have to yeah it's a it, it is miserable as it is um not being not having some outlet for this would just uh, i it's my belief we were put in this world to to make things and that is like a the effect of of being creative and creating something and making something it doesn't necessarily be a book it's whatever that is our purpose for existence and so it's it's good that i can continue to do that myself while also you know providing some way for other people uh to do it and hopefully support each other along the way well thank you so much it's been so good to talk about writing and about citation and about our crazy you know like habits and how we <laughs> ultimately <laughs> whatever you. it takes to finish to help us finish a project we've started because i'm a true believer that to be a creative genius at play, which is the name of this podcast, you must finish what you start. Whether you put it out in the world or not, that's a whole different topic for a different day. It but it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be good. It does have, however, need to be done. Yes, yes, and uh, I, I, I truly believe that, uh, and why I'm so passionate and asked you to be on the show today. That station is like so good that I couldn't not share it. And I'm not getting anything like to say that. Like it's, I just contacted JJ and went like, I must have you on the show. And I could tell that you were a crazy creative behind the scenes. I could always feel it about you. <laughs> <laughs> no one could make a program that's that like intuitive, know what I'm thinking. And oh. uh, yeah, so thank you, you so know, much. Feedback, so wonderful to talk to you. Uh, the things you've said have really helped um, make what I'm doing worthwhile and help keep motivating to keep moving forward thank you pleasure so all the links to citation will be in the show notes 
and um, there's some cool updates coming, which I'm so excited about. But even what it is today is fantastic. Go go check it out. I hope you really enjoyed this interview and keep writing. That's the most important part. Thanks, JJ. Thank you. Did you find that interview valuable? Great. Now be an awesome human and go and leave a review because it helps the podcast out so much. Want to read the show notes? Check out thechildrensbookauthorpodcast.com. Want to find out more about me, Eleanor Page? Find me at eleanorpage.com or come and say hello on social at Eleanor Page Books. Until next time, keep writing and keep learning.